My name is John Becker. For the past four decades, I've dedicated my life to protecting tactical operators. During this time, I've worked with many of the world's top law enforcement and military units. As a result, I've had the privilege of working with the amazing leaders who take teams into the world's most dangerous situations. The goal of this podcast is to share their stories in hopes of making us all better leaders, better thinkers, and better people. Welcome to The Debrief. My guest today is Dana Vylander. Dana spent 32 years with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, working 26 of those years in the Elite Special Enforcement Bureau, or SED. First as a canine for four years, then as a SWAT operator for four years, and finally as a tactical medic with Emergency Services Division for 18 years. Because of his unique experiences and very broad skill set, Dana has trained with and provided training to some of the most elite military and law enforcement units in the world, working in tactical combat casualty care as well as rural operations, vertical access, and rope and high angle rescue work. Dana, thanks so much for joining me today on the debrief. Thanks for having me, John. First, let's let's kind of walk through your your career path because it's kind of a unique one. You you you've worked kind of both sides of of, of the tactical world. So why don't, why don't we go back to the beginning? Oh, to the very beginning. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, in college, I actually met a PJ who just gotten out. This is in the late seventies, and we discussed it, and it really fascinated me what PJs were doing at that time. Uh, I don't know if he was in Vietnam or not, but he inspired me to delve into it. And uh, when I went to the recruiter's office, it wasn't the pathway that they have today where they have a pipeline to prepare you for the, the testing and stuff like that. So uh, that part of it didn't appeal to me, but it was always in the back of my mind. So in 1982, I enlisted in the Air Force Reserve as a uh, security policeman. And what's interesting is in that unit was an LA Sheriff's deputy. There were a number of deputies and police officers that were in the unit. And that deputy uh, at the time just happened to be Jack Yule. Oh, man. So that's where we met was in the Air Force Reserve back about 1982, 83. It's uh, like saying, yeah, I met this guy named Babe Ruth. And he's like, hey, you want to hit baseballs? Yeah. yeah. So um, he encouraged me to apply to the Sheriff's Department. Uh, set me up on a ride along on Firestone Park with Vic Rodriguez and uh, his partner, I believe it was John Hogeen, who died uh, a few months after that in a shooting, um, but I was, I was really happy. I wanted to do that. So chose the Sheriff's Department. I applied to LAPD, Long Beach PD, Sheriff's Department all at the same time. The Sheriff's picked me up first and I'm glad they did. I had a blessed career. Um, while working patrol had some interaction with the Special Enforcement Bureau, but not a lot. But I knew that was where I wanted to go because when I initially got, came on the department, they had a unit called the Emergency Services Detail which was essentially a civilian equivalent of the PJs. Um, so I was in the reserves until 1990, May of 1990. Um, I tested for SEB itself, SED for the SWAT side. And I was encouraged to try out for K-9 as well. So I tried out for K-9. Uh, during that time, uh, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 19, uh, August of 1990. And if I had still been in the reserves, I probably wouldn't have got to the Special Enforcement Bureau. So it was kind of fortuitous that, uh, you know, I got out in May uh, because the unit did go to Kuwait. And uh, K-9 picked me up in January 91 and went through SWAT school, got the K-9, uh, had, you know, countless operations like you do as a K-9 handler. And um, some years, oh, yeah, it was about four years, I went over to the SED, so the SWAT side. Um, John Ajay, um, who passed uh, in 1998, he and I did a body swap. He wanted to come over K-9, and I wanted to go to SWAT. That was mm. one of my goals, was to go to SWAT, and uh, worked my way up through the teams. Uh, I was actively involved in the sniper program, entry team member, and in 1998, I tested again for the emergency services detail or ESD and was chosen uh, to go there. So in 1998, went through paramedic school, which is the first thing you have to do. 
And uh, from there, mountain rescue training and then dive training. And uh, spent the next 18 years there as a hoist operator, crew chief on Air Rescue 5, and search and rescue medic, uh, recovery diver, uh, swap medic. So, so talk, maybe for those that don't know LA Sheriff's ESD, kind of give us a, a, you know, a thumbnail sketch of the unit. So when I got there, it was an 18-man unit. You had three sergeants, uh, 15 deputies, deputy paramedics. So everybody had to go to paramedic school. And uh, you had all this training and experience. And at the time, we, ha we would have five guys on a shift, basically. So you had two in Air 5 working as, as uh, helicopter rescue medics. And then the other guys were on the ground driving Angeles Crest, uh, Azusa Canyon, Tahunga Canyon. You know, you're, you're up in the mountains. And if a SWAT activation happened, then you would just drive out of the mountains to wherever the SWAT activation was. And so you worked intimately uh, with the, search, the volunteer search and rescue teams for LA County. Um, and you pretty much were busy all the time. Uh, they had a, a, a unique schedule. It was a 72 hour on uh, schedule, six, three, three days on, six days off. Hmm. And uh, I can remember the longest shift I had was 70 hours of being awake for 70 hours, uh, just going from call to call to call, yeah, which is great. So I think one of the things that's unique about ESD is it's got, it's got this multi-mission profile, right? Like how do those missions silo out? Give me like the, the kind of, you know, they've got a rescue, obviously a search and rescue mission. What else does ESD do? Well, the, the, the tactical medics on every SWAT operation and SWAT operations basically uh, were the king. So if, if you were, well, if you're actively involved in a search and rescue mission, say on the ground, um, they would just have to call guys in to, to cover the SWAT mission. But if you were just out patrolling, like I said, on Angeles Crest or something like that, and a SWAT mission came in, you'd have to respond to the SWAT call. And uh, that was pretty much the primary function because uh, when I first got there, uh, if you think about warrant services and, and some of the barricades where the, the entry team wants to pull the front door, the, the front hardened door off of the, off the house, it was ESD that would do that. We had the only truck that, that had a huge uh, like boat cleat on the front of the truck. And somebody would go up with the, the big fish hook like this with the, with the cables attached and hit, hook them to the front door. And then we would tie it off real fast and then drive back and, and pull the door off the, off the house. And that was, that was one of our missions on, for uh, barricades, uh, but more particularly on the warrant service, the early morning warrant service. That was, that was a real common thing we were used for. And then we're there, obviously, as, as medics. But there's, there's also a dive component to ESD, right? Right. Let me, so the history of ESD, let me do that real quick. Yeah, so sure. The Special Enforcement Bureau, or the Special Enforcement Detail started in 1958. It was basically like a saturation patrol team of guys. You had to be over six feet to be in the unit at the time. So real policemen. So that it was a goon there. squad. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, so in 1966, Sheriff Pitches started, uh, created the emergency services detail. And the, the job was to have active duty deputies up in the mountains on search and rescue missions. And the, the unit with Frank Waldron uh, was the sergeant and the, the, basically the founder of the unit. Uh, they picked up the recovery diving. Uh, so anybody that goes missing, any uh, object, evidence, anything like that, planes in the ocean, if they need to be recovered, it was the ESD's job to dive on those things. So typically it was in lakes, pitch black water, no visibility whatsoever uh, for evidence and dead feeling, bodies. Feeling your way like, around. Feeling your way for around, yeah, exactly. So, but, but we would uh, also be out at Catalina around Catalina Island and then also around San Clemente Island. So San Clemente Island is actually a piece of LA County. And the waters around it, you know, you have a lot of active scuba divers, uh, fishermen, things like that. So if a scuba diver went missing or died off of San Clemente Island, ESD would do the scuba dive death investigation of that, which they still do today. They do all the dive uh, accidents or dive death uh, investigations out of the special ESD. So, I mean, that's a pretty, especially for a law enforcement unit, that's a pretty broad skill set. You've got a dive component, you've got, you know, ropes and, and high angle rescue combined with tactical, you know, combat casualty care. Right. All in, all in one unit. Right. So it, it does take a lot, but uh, luckily, I mean, tra retraining, uh, constant training. But luckily, like with, uh, let's just say Air Rescue 5, 
um, you're using all of those skills on, all, on an almost daily basis. When you, when you load the helicopter, you have your dive gear, you have your medic gear, you have your rope rescue gear, and you have your SWAT gear that all goes in the helicopter and goes with you wherever you go. The only thing you don't have is tanks, because tanks are rather heavy, you know. And so they, they, but those are staged around the county, so if a dive uh, came up at the operation, you'd change your, into your wetsuit while flying to, the, to pick up your tanks or flying to the, uh, the dive scene and just make it happen like that. So a big component of ESD is kind of the, the tactical medic thing. Early in your career, talk to me about what that was like. Like what was the, uh, you know, at some point TCCC becomes a thing. Right. Prior to that, what, what was the, the strategy? That's a good question because uh, there's a real good history of, of SEB uh, in, a, in a book. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it by John Coleman. But uh, the history of that is there. And um, basically in the ESD were more like first aiders. Than, than anything else. They started going to paramedic school in the early 70s when LA County initiated the first paramedic institute. So they were getting the paramedic training, but, but still they were doing basic, more like basic first aid. They could do IVs and things like that. And so when they, they integrated with SED in, uh, I wanna say it was 1970 or 71, they were still kind of in a first aid mode. Roll into the 80s, uh, there's a lot of doctors around the country who were interested in, in the tactical world. And uh, Rich Carmona was one. Um, Rich Carmona, eventually Surgeon General Rich Carmona. Yes, that Rich yeah. Carmona out of Pima County, Arizona. Yeah. He has an interesting career. But uh, so the, the development of, and they called it TEMS, or Tactical Emergency Medical Skills, uh, at the time was still more like first aid. You know, you could do your paramedic skills, but the tactical component really hadn't gotten hold yet. So fast forward to 1996, uh, I'm sorry, so 1989, NTOA and uh, Rich Carmona and uh, the SEB, they hosted the first actual NTOA TEMS course in the country. And then next year was held in Pima County in 1990. So those are kind of the, the beginnings right there. Uh, through the nine, early 90s into the, about the time I came into the unit, they started a tactical EMT program, but it was still kind of a f medic first aid kind of a course. Yeah, it's still not e a lot it's of It's EMT. We're not yeah, yet we're not, we're not there to the TCCC yet. Yeah. yeah. TCCC as a concept started in 1996. With Black Hawk Down? Uh, well, 1993 was Black Hawk Down, Battle of the Red Sea. Yeah. And um, 18 dead and 73 wounded. And uh, Frank Butler, John Hagman, and then there's another doctor out of the military with the last name of Butler. They, they wrote this paper, and what they did was they did a retrospective studies back to World War II, Korea. What are the patterns of injury? What are the patterns of preventable death? And when they looked at what happened in, in Mogadishu, they're saying that there's, there was a correlation there so that you could die from getting shot in an extremity within two to three minutes if nothing is done for it. And my first EMT class back in 1978 at, at college, uh, tourniquets were forbidden. You, you never put it, if you put, put a tourniquet on that limb, you're gonna lose that limb. Yeah, so you just yeah I remember that. You just didn't put a tourniquet on. And what, what these uh, doctors advocated was tourniquets, uh, pressure dressings, wound packing, things that were not in the normal world, like you see today, will stop the bleed. So it was, it was revolutionary in 1996. There was only one military unit that actually adopted it back then, and that was uh, when Stanley McChrystal was the colonel, the, the regiment commander of the 75th Ranger Regiment, instituted it. They have a great program to this day, uh, and, but it was still slow to, to pick up in the rest of the military. In the civilian world, there was still no knowledge of this, other than the fact, unless you saw the, the paper itself, the tactical. Yeah, I mean, tactic nobody paper. carried tourniquets. No ambulances didn't have tourniquets. No. Like it was not a it was not a thing. Right. And, and when you say preventable death, 
if my understanding is correct, what you mean is if we had had basic life-saving capability, yes. that person survives. Yes. For instance, they bleed out from an injury that you could stop the bleeding with. Right. So if you want to and, and look back at some of the old first aid training manuals from EMT classes, from colleges, whatever it is, when they're talking about um, what's the, the common acronym for first aid? ABC. ABCs, right? Airway, breathing, circulation. Well, in those manuals, if you actually go back and look at it, it, it will say in there, and if, by the way, if the person is bleeding severely, stop the bleeding first before you address anything else. But that's, that was completely glossed over. Well, it was like, oh, put a little pressure on it. Right. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Elevation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Elevate it and put pressure on it. He's missing yeah. a foot. Uh, lots of pressure? Yeah. 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 So that was, uh, that was what they did was they brought this to light, you know, that this was good. Let's go up a few years. 2001, Operation Enduring Freedom, Afghanistan. Even the military special units didn't really follow TCCC at that point early on. Getting into Iraq, 2003, 2004, it still wasn't being taught pretty much to most of the medical community within the military. Special operations started to get that training and they started to get things like live tissue training to do it. But what was the problem with all of the training that the military is getting and that these doctors identified that was the, the, the training, if you, if you took advanced trauma life support, say as a course, as a doctor, as a medic, whatever, you, you went to advanced, it's based on being in a hospital. And you have every resource in the world when you're in a hospital. But when you're on a target house, on a SWAT operation or on a military operation, you're, you could be hundreds of miles away from something or even in LA County, if you're in the high desert, you could be 60 miles from a trauma center. And what, what do you have as your medical supplies? Usually it's gonna be in a backpack yeah. or even smaller if you're a team without a, say a dedicated medic and you may have an individual first aid kit. Yeah, but even, even I mean, IFAX even were, was not a thing. They're not a thing. Right, like people might have a boo-boo kit but they weren't carrying yeah, band-aids, some gauze, co-bands, maybe yeah. ace wraps, something like that. Yeah, yeah but exactly. they weren't carrying IFAX right. or, or, or tourniquets or compression bandages or any of the stuff that now we regard as kind of de rigueur. Right, when I got to ESC in 1998, I was given a, a, a Harper pack, which is a butt pack, and you, you filled it up basically with you know, the gauze, the wraps, the things like that. Um, not even chest seals at the time. You know, you, you'd have, uh, Vaseline gauze to, to create a, a three-sided occlusive dressing if you had a chest injury or a abdominal evisceration or something like that. So that came later. Um, 1998, when I got there, paramedic school, like I said, dive school, mountain rescue school, got on the helicopter, started flying. And then it was about that time we started to see a transition in the guys from the unit. Um, the older guys that, that were retiring and then more guys were coming in. With Iraq and Afghanistan, you started to see how the, tour the, the tourniquet started to take hold. Because they had to, because all the blast injuries that were happening in Iraq. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty much some, a lot of catastrophic injuries. And the, the early tourniquets that they had was the CAT tourniquet by North American Rescue. About 2004, uh, TechMed Solutions, Ross Johnson developed, he was a Special Forces medic, developed the, the, the uh, soft T. Soft T. Yeah. And that was, those were basically the two basic tourniquets, uh, two go-to tourniquets on the market at the time. And there were others out there. You had the NATO tourniquet, you had different people doing different things, but those are the two basic tourniquets. Um, I was fortunate enough in 2000 to be flying Air 5 when two PJs from a special tactics squadron on the East Coast came out to fly on Air 5 with us. And I maintained contact with one of them, Mike, and through the years, he guided me towards military courses. And one of them that he guided to me is John Hagman, one of the writers of the TCCC paper, his company, Deployment Medicine International. They were doing live tissue training for the, for the military. And I was lucky enough to get into one of those courses. And that's when I saw the tourniquets that were out there. And when you're working on something that's bloody, you have uh, dirt and everything else going on, uh, it, it makes a big difference when you're trying to turn, as opposed to you and I sitting here and applying a tourniquet to your arm or to your leg. You, you, in, with live tissue training, there's real blood, there's real dirt, there's a lot of things going on, 
And so you can see how these tools work in that environment. So, so when is, okay, so tourniquets start to come in. Right. TCCC begins to really take hold in the military. In the military, yes. And, and at what point is the MARCH acronym developed? Is that as part of the initial launch of, of TCCC? MARCH was, yes, MAR. Originally it was MAR and then CH came later. But it was, yeah, massive hemorrhage, airways, and then respirations or breathing. So it was just, it, it wasn't ABC reversed because the C in MARCH is still circulation. But you're dealing with shock and you're dealing with any additional injuries that you may come across. But massive hemorrhage was the big one. If, if, like you said, if, if, if your foot's missing and you've got blood squirting out, you need to stop it. And direct pressure and even putting a constricting band isn't going to work. You need a tourniquet that you have to stop the bleeding. When did we figure out that, because I remember as a kid, my brother was hit on his motorcycle when he was really young, had a compound fracture of his femur, would have bled out, severed femoral artery. And a med student from USC came by and improvised a tourniquet and, and shut the bleeding off. And I remember the discussion about they're going to cut his leg off and it's going to cost him his leg. And, you know, when did we figure out that that was just not true? It was the data coming out of the war. Iraq, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Also, the Israelis had experience with tourniquets. And they, they found that you could have, safely have a tourniquet on for two to four hours was the time frame. Uh, the Israelis actually had an experience with... Uh, a guy having a tourniquet on for 11 hours with no loss of uh, nerve, with no nerve damage, no loss in sensation, anything like that. So it was that experience that the military, being the driver of this program in the beginning, that that's where they said, yeah, these are safe. And it was about 2005, 2006, ESD, we, we continued to funnel guys into these live tissue courses. So those concepts came with us, and, and we started teaching actually a, a TCCC program in about 2006. I want to say, right before the uh, NTOA conference in LA, we were, we were already going down that path. And we started to do some, just some kind of uh, familiarization classes out at patrol stations about the March algorithm and doing things. And you, you would hear patrol guys would, would come up and say, it's like, why aren't they teaching this to us in the academy? So that was back then, which they do now. Yeah. Probably nationwide they're doing that. I think so. I think, I think most places now we've kind of developed that people are carrying IFACs. You know, I mean, if, if there is a silver lining to the Afghan and Iraq wars, it is the massive expansion of TCCC knowledge and understanding of, of hemorrhage control and the devices that work, the devices that don't work. Uh, you know, they were, they were obviously born of, of tragedy, but yeah. I, I, there are a lot of police officers that are alive today because TCCC was pushed down. Absolutely, absolutely. Police officers, citizens, yep. and, and then even suspects. So the, the, that, the fact that it's out in the police community, is just, it's great for everybody. Uh, there's that video of an Oklahoma officer that was shot just recently, making contact with a guy this, this close when the suspect pulls out a gun and starts shooting at him. He gets hit in the leg. He follows the TCCC principles. He runs to cover. There's a vehicle there while he's still engaging the guy as the suspect. Oh, yeah, I remember away. this one. Did you see that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a great one. And then he comes back out to see where the suspect is. The guy's running away. So he pulls his tourniquet out and applies it to his leg, continuing to communicate on the radio. Yeah. Did a fantastic job. Yeah, he really did. So, and that's what you see. You look at um, LAPD saving their own, also putting them on citizens downtown when they were having some of the riots and things like that. They're, they're, a police officer, yeah, it's, it's for him. But in that moment, you see a lot of police officers will apply it to the citizens or the suspects. Yeah, I mean, you even see you see suspects that are surviving that have been, you know, in, engaging police and getting shot, and and the team is rescuing the guy with their own medical gear. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's it strikes me that it's kind of good all the way around. What, from your experience, how do we maintain this? Like it's. We've had this big spike, and in the 35 years I've done this, you'll see things come into favor, and then you see them go out of favor, and you know it's like we build a capability, and then it gradually, you know, attrition takes it down, and we go, oh my God, we have to do this, and we start over again. If you're an agency, how do you maintain this this capability of, of T Triple C? You think? That's a good question. It takes the, uh, somebody at the agency, somebody whether it's an appointed person or. You know, somebody takes it on themselves, which you see that in a lot of agencies. A guy just takes on a project and he, he owns that project. But they need to have some sort of a manager 
so that the, tr the training continues, and more importantly, the budget for the equipment. Well, budget for the equipment and the training, because the training is money as, as well. Yeah, sure. But, but definitely on the equipment side, I, I think as far as state of the art when it comes to the, the devices and, and all the techniques and things like that, I think we're, we're probably there for a while. But it's just maintaining that budget so that supplies are replenished. You evaluate your training program, and uh, and then what what are you giving the guys in their IFACs in their first aid kits? So let's let's dissect that a little deeper. So first, starting with the training, what what in your opinion, how many different levels are there of training here? Like obviously, we want first aid training, you know, T triple C training for patrol officers, right? SWAT team's probably a little higher level, SWAT medics. H how do you dissect that in an agency? Take a middle-sized agency, you know, 500 officers. What, what, how many different levels of expertise would you try to implement? Oh, I would, I would keep it at maybe just two levels. So like for the SWAT team, because SWAT teams train more regularly than I think patrol officers do. Sure. So, you know, a one to two day program every year for patrol, is fine, I okay. think. Well, I, I wouldn't say fine because I would obviously want it better. But, yeah, right. but uh, I think, and on the SWAT side, you know, every quarter they should have a day at least. You know, you look at the initial training, usually you're talking about, you go through the TCCC program, then you're showing them the tourniquets, you, everybody goes to the tourniquets. I think the next phase is that putting them into the, the uh, a training operational mode where they're coming upon casualties and having to deal with them. And SWAT teams are pretty good at doing that too. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the things that we're seeing emerging with a lot of the teams we're working with is, is kind of a, a, for lack of a better term, like a three-tiered approach where you've got IFACs for individuals, you have a team medic who is carrying a backpack and has other, other levels of equipment, and then kind of a third tier of equipment, which is really mass casualty care. Right, it's throw bags, it's, you know. Right, um, right. What are your thoughts on that? I, I agree with it. We had bigger backpacks in our armored vehicles for calls. We would have uh, rope access equipment in our Bearcats, and then we would also have the bigger ones for the, for the mass casualty. And it makes sense to have the mass casualty stuff because you are gonna be, you look at San Bernardino, and as the team makes entry and you have 30 casualties on the floor, you know, what do you do? And, uh, you know, the companies, NAR has done a very good job of it. Tech Meds has done a good, I'm sure, Safeguard Medical. They all have these mass casualty bags where you can just drop a kit as you go, roll a person in the recovery position so they don't die an airway death, but then people coming in will see, see an IFAC next to them or something like that, or a throw kit that's down on the ground next to the casualty, absolutely. Yeah, I think one of the things that came out of San Bernardino is there are a lot of people that are alive today that would have died had there not been a tactical medic or medics who, who had the ability to quickly look at somebody and just put them in a recovery position. Right. Right, they're unconscious, they're having a hard time breathing, just rolled them into a recovery position. And that's the thing that should go out even to patrol, because who's, who's gonna be first on scene a lot of times? Almost always patrol. You know, I mean, luckily at San Bernardino, the teams were training just down the road. So they were on scene like that. But and, and a, on a normal MCI, normal active shooter with multiple people down, it's gonna be patrol. It's just like the active duty procedures have changed from, from Columbine where we're gonna wait outside and wait for the SWAT team to now if you're a lone officer, you're supposed to go in there and address this guy and, and, and eliminate the threat if you can. So that's a, that's a quantum leap from where we were 25 years ago with, uh, with Columbine. So Dana, why don't we start with individual uh, gear. Talk to me about an IFAC. What, what should be in an IFAC? So an IFAC is actually designed for you. It's not for you to take off and, and use what you have in your kit on somebody else. So it's, it's designed, and the, the commercial kits that are out there, so you'll have, typically you'll have a tourniquet, you'll have uh, one or two chest seals, preferably two chest seals, which we can talk about. Uh, and then you have a, a gauze, whether hemostatic gauze or just regular gauze, and then you're gonna have some sort of a compression wrap. You could have scissors, you could have gloves, you could have a, a casualty card in it, you know, to make notes if you wanted to, but that's typically what you see in an IFAC. So why don't we walk through the components, starting with a tourniquet. Um, the major, two major tourniquets are still kind of cat and soft tea, right? Right, yeah. There's some really uh, good ones from other ones, like I said, Safeguard Medical. Some other companies have, have all come out with good tourniquets that are all committee on TCCC approved. 
Okay. So is that kind of the industry standard? Like look for something that's committee on TCCC approved. And, yes. Yeah. And that's the you know yeah. good yeah. housekeeping seal, right. as it were. Um, okay. And then what about gauze? Well, back up to tourniquets just for yeah. a second. So for a, a SWAT guy, um, he should have a tourniquet where somewhere on his plate carrier vest, whatever it is, where he can get to it with either hand. Because if he's shot in his left arm or shot in his right arm, you have to be able to reach it with either hand. Um, and then in the IFAC, you should probably have a, a second tourniquet. Because uh, you could get shot more than once. You might have to treat yourself that way. Yeah, we just actually it just embedded into one of our plate carriers now a tourniquet into the bottom of the vest. Where it's just, it's, it's at your stomach, it's there all the time. And that's the, you know, I use this for you. And... What do you think about the idea of, of locating IFACs and tourniquets and those kinds of things on, especially with SWAT cops, putting it someplace that everybody knows where it is on a guy? There's philosophical differences on that. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, I think it's a good idea. If everybody has their IFAC in one place, everybody knows where to go to for that IFAC. If, if I come on John and John has his IFAC, on his right shoulder, and I go to look for it, you know, down where everybody else has it. You know, you're just delaying care. Our our job is to to keep every drop of blood in them. So you're you're just having that seconds delay if if you have to find the guy's IFAC or whether it's in his cargo pocket or whatever it is. So I, I like the idea of having him located the same. So and and does it make sense for a team to use the same IFAC and the same gear? Because you know you'll see teams where everybody has the same gear. And you'll see other teams where everybody has individual gear. What are your thoughts on that? Well, is the individual gear because they're having to buy it themselves? That, and that's an issue, right? So if you're going to do something like that, everybody on the team should know what's in each, each person's IFAC. And then you have to pull it out and show them how to use. If you have a different IFAC or a different tourniquet than everybody else, you better show everybody how to do it. Because you might be unconscious and they have to apply your tourniquet on you. And you said, a, you said a second ago, like, we need to keep every drop of blood in their body. Talk to me the, about the significance of that. Right. So if you go back to MAR from the original TCCC paper, tourniquets, stop the bleeding. The second part of massive hemorrhage that, that they identified, and they, they were kind of throwing it out to industry, that if you, if you think about the one ranger that died on, on, uh, in the movie, uh, Ranger Smith, the PJ or the SF medic, he's trying to clamp his artery because it was way up high in, in his uh, in a pelvic region, right? Couldn't do it, couldn't clamp it. And he ends up bleeding out as a result of that. So what they put out there in the TCCC paper was we need a hemostatic agent embedded in the gauze so that it can be packed into a wound. So blood stopping agent, uh, commercially made by a number of companies now, but it's embedded in the gauze, and you're going to pack the, pack the wound just like you would with normal gauze. So that's like Silox and, and, you know, their variety yeah, of Yeah, Hemcon, yeah. Uh, combat gauze. Some yeah, variety of things. But, but you're not only packing gauze, you're packing in a clotting agent, basically. Essentially, yes. Yeah. De depending on what the chemistry is on how it's going to affect the clots, how it's going to create clots. What is it? Give me some, give me more there. On that? Yeah. So uh, the one that is from, uh, I'm sorry, Z-Medica, the combat gauze. So originally there was uh, Hemcon or something like Hemcon, which is a, a derivative from uh, seafood or sea life casings. Yeah, you know, like shell, shellfish. Shell, shell, yeah, um, which doesn't have any, it, it creates a, a clot at the site. So with combat gauze, what it is, it works on the clotting factor within your body. So it's, uh, I forget the name off the top of my head right now, for the agent that they're using, uh, kaolin. They're kind of a kaolin-based uh, agent that they use, and it works on the actual clotting factors to build a clot at the site. To force the body into building the clot. Right. Okay. As opposed to creating, a, 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 say, a plug. On Got it. And so, so I've heard conflicting arguments on, on using hemostatic gauze that, that, you know, doctors don't like it. it it complicates, you know, cleanup and all that. And then I've heard the exact opposite, that no, it doesn't matter. It stops bleeding immediately. That's the right answer. Well, that's a, that's a really good uh, thing to bring up because when you're teaching stop the bleed to, to civilians now, 
And that, that's where we're at in society today. This all came from TCCC. But when you're telling, talking to civilians, you say, put anything in that wound that you can possibly put into it. T-shirt, a sock, underwear, anything, dirt, grass, stuff it in that wound if you have to, if that's all you have available to try to stop the bleeding. So to, to say that there's an argument from doctors that a hemostatic agent in, embedded in gauze is a problem, no. So, so when you're doing that, right, when you're, you're shoving gauze, you're shoving a sock, you're shoving whatever, what are you really trying to do? You're trying to get in here so that you're, you're pinching the artery down, packing it as tight as you possibly can to keep it that way, and then you're going to wrap it with a compression wrap to, to keep it right there. Is the goal at that point to, to cause the blood to clot, or is the goal to Both. pinch the artery down? Both. Got it. Okay. Because you might not be 100% successful in pinching that artery, but yeah. you're going to pack it, that wound as tight as you can. Because again, we're just trying to retain every bit of blood we possibly can in yes. the body. Yeah. So, so going forward with an IFAC, tourniquet, some form of gauze. Right. Compression wrap. Compression wrap, which is, how are we going to use a compression wrap? So typically like an ACE wrap or Coban or something like that, you're going you're gonna to bring it around tight, as tight as you possibly can. And, uh, Again, and creating compression, compression exactly. on the wound site. Yeah. Got it. So that's an individual first aid kit. Right. Let me, I'm sorry, we, we, we skipped over the chest seals. So when I started, for, to create an occlusive dressing, you had uh, petroleum gauze, and you would use tape to create that three-sided occlusive dressing over a hole in the chest. What industry did was they created chest seals using a, a gel substance, hydrogel kind of a substance that said it would stick. If you think about normal first aid tape that you have in the house or the white first aid tape that you have, if you're sweaty or if you're a hairy man, Doesn't work. it's not gonna work. Well, the creation of, through industry of these chest seals, it will stick. And then it, they all have now, so you had a three-sided occlusive dressing so that air could escape if it needed to. Now they all have vents in these chest seals so that you, all you do is have to put the chest seal over the wound and it, it should vent on its own. And the intent is to maintain the vacuum integrity of the chest? Right. We don't want air coming in. We don't any, want any more air even exiting an injured lung into the chest cavity that can't escape, but we don't want any air coming in from the outside also. Got it. Okay, so that's, that's individual first aid kit. Right. Let's move up to a team. Okay. What, what do you think the best methodology for a team to carry their gear? Everybody's got an IFAC, I'm assuming, to start. And then is it is a, each of the tactical medics then is going to carry a secondary backpack? Right. Yeah. So when we were, when we were doing uh, SWAT operations, warrant service or barricade suspect or whatever, I had a small pack. But I had four additional tourniquets. I had more hemostatics, more gauze, more chest seals, and then you know some of the diagnostic stuff that that you, that you would need, you know, like a, a pulse oximeter, things like that. So then, when we're talking about a mass casualty event and these mass casualty bags, um, it's basically a, a series of throw bags, right? It's a series of little individually packed. What do you see as in those individual throw bags? Tourniquet, chest seal. If they, if they can afford it. You don't see chest seals often in those, in those casualty kits, but I would say a chest seal. Uh, hemostatic, if you can afford it. You remember, hemostatic started about the $50 range. So if you're a small, small agency, you, know, you put 20 kits together, that's $1,000. What's in your budget? Just in hemostatic gauze. Just in hemostatic as gauze. As opposed to like Z gauze or rolled gauze, which is? Rolled gauze is a dollar and a half. Dollar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you'll, you'll see rolled gauze, usually a space blanket, try to keep them warm which is part of the H in March. Uh, chest seal be good. If not a chest seal, they'll have the uh, petroleum gauze in it also. Yeah. Compression wrap. Okay, and so the, the methodology being, if you have a mass casualty now, you can hand out these throw bags, which then allows one medic to direct bystanders, helpers, exactly. people working on themselves the idea being to scale the, the medic. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. And a lot of them you'll see like up to 20 of these throw kits in there. What is your recommendation? Like if, if an agency starting a program or starting a tactical paramedic, a tactical medic program, 
What's your recommendation as to where they go for training? What, what do you see as the, the best resources? There's good training agencies or training companies around the United States. I think one of the best ones, uh, if you looked at it, was Strategic Operations down in San Diego. They're, they're, they're nonstop teaching the military uh, in TCCC procedures, both out of hospital and in hospital, what they have down there at their location. But they're also into the TECC uh, program, so they're teaching a lot of police fire on the same, exact same techniques. So what's the difference between TCCC and TECC? That's a good question. So TCCC is military focus. The word combat, some people not in the military or not in the SWAT world thought that might be sound offensive. Um, I think we all know that a gunfight is a gunfight, combat is combat. Yeah. But they, they removed it so that fire departments would be probably more amicable, fire departments and others, and the general public, knowing that you have a TECC, tactical emergency casualty care, as Got opposed it. to tactical combat. So before we wrap this up on, on TCCC stuff, is there anything else you think that teams should, or, or individual operators should be thinking about or, or looking at? I think one of the things is have realistic training. You're following up on your training question, have, have realistic training and put uh, your casualties when you're doing this training in unique positions. And, and just remember the guidelines are, you know, direct fire, you're in your return fire, get to cover first. You know, address the gunfight and then address the casualty when you can, if he can't be taking care of himself. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, one of the things that, that you'll see in training is people go, that's unrealistic. Uh, you know, that's, a, that's an unrealistic scenario that, that, you know, a casualty would be stuck on a roof or it's an unrealistic scenario that a casualty would be stuck behind a bookcase. And, and it, you know, if we've learned anything through our lecture series and if we've learned anything just through the debriefs we've done through this show, it, it, you ask yourself as the story evolves, could it get worse? Oh, it can't get worse. And then it gets worse. And then it gets worse again. And then it gets worse again. And it's just, you know, you see these circumstances where it just gets perpetually worse. And the training seems, you know, training seems to fall into these patterns of like, oh, okay, well, Dana's going to be our test guy. He's in the middle of the room on the floor and the suspect is already dead. And, and you know, I, I just did an interview with, with Buddy Brown from York County, South Carolina. The suspect is under a deck. He shot three guys. He's killed one and he's given up. And he's 30 feet from you and two of your guys are bleeding to death. What do you do? And so it's like when you talk about realistic training, and, and you, you asked Buddy, he, he said, we never trained for that. We never thought the guy would give up. Now the guy's throwing his gun out. He's hands up. So now you're holding at him, but are you dealing with him? Are you dealing with your, you know, with your guys? How are you getting the guys out? You know, Buddy himself is a big guy. They had a hard time carrying him. They kept dropping him. Um, you know, I, I think, what would you recommend in those training iterations? What are the things that people need to think about when they're designing a training scenario? Well, first off, I would say every time you do team training, you, th you put casualties into it. The more often you include casualties in your team training, you know, for, for, particularly for the part-time teams that maybe get once a month or twice a month, every time you do entry training, you should be putting casualties in there. Because exactly what Buddy was saying, you know, you never trained for that. If, if you never trained for that scenario, how will you react? And, you know, there's that old saying, you don't rise to the occasion, you, you revert to your uh, lowest level of training or highest level of training, whichever that way that went. But if you have never even thought about this before, this concept, you know, that I could have a casualty with a suspect right here, what am I going to do? You know, and that's, that's what you need to put into your team training. You have to put that in. And the military is really good at doing that, invoking casualties. And, and th through the courses that, um, that we have, we, we do that a lot. So that guys get used to that. Not get used to it from the standpoint that, you know, if, if that's one of their friends, you know, they're going to be, they're, they wouldn't be upset about it. But it's, no, it's, it's an immediate action drill. Yeah. Right? That's a really good way to put it. It's an immediate action drill where you've, you have conditioned the team that when this happens, we do this. And, and, you know, as you said, in all the debriefs that I've attended over the years, that's exactly what happens. Everybody defaults to the level of their training. And, and so I, I like that idea. One of the things that, that you and I have talked about and, and is kind of a, 
a logical extension of where we're here is ropes work. And, and using ropes work specifically to, to you know, evac people, to, to move them, to do whatever. Why don't we start just with kind of, you know, Dana's thumbnail sketch of the history of rappelling in SWAT. Like, you know, I, it all goes back to, you know, the SWAT TV show and guys th swinging through windows. But, um, you know, w give, me, give me kind of your, your take on yeah. it. Yeah, so the, the ropes haven't been used a lot. In, in tactical situations, other than in the, uh, let's just say the suicidal jumper type of a situation. But go back in history, you know, everybody's familiar with the Princess Gate, the Iranian embassy storming by the SAS, you know, going through the windows. And I think that's what everybody's opinion is of repelling and, and rope work. When I got to the team uh, in, we had to repel in SWAT school, and I think just about every SWAT school probably has a, a repelling segment. But it's, I, I think it's more of just a hoo-ya, uh, more of a confidence, confidence drill, yeah. yeah, something like that. And I, th I think they're, they're missing out on seeing the other applications. If your snipers are elevated, you know, how are they getting up there? If, they, if, they, if there's not a ladder, if there's not a stairwell, if, if they have to uh, get down in a hurry. So in addition to repelling, though, for the, for the rope work side of SWAT, most teams don't don't do it. You know, like I said, they have the suicidal jumper considerations where a negotiator will be out there. And there's there's very few teams that are actually doing that. I know San Diego is doing that. LAPD does that. Um, at, with the ESD handles that at the Special Enforcement Bureau. And I'm sure New York, NYPD and, you know, I'm sure agencies around the country are doing that. But it's an interesting thing when you talk about doing a, a tactical rope access course with teams and they're from small towns. They say, oh, well, we only have two and three story buildings, so I don't need to worry about that. And if I could just tell a quick story in a oh. conversation with, a, with an LAPD officer was, they, they had a, a crazy guy on top of a restaurant. He's compliant, but they gotta get him down. Fire department won't help him, help them, because he's a suspect. He's a crazy guy. Yeah, yeah. so they have to get up there on their own, they get down there on their own. So they use a dumpster to climb up on top of the roof, handcuff the guy, he's compliant and then they have to get him down and they kind of drop him to the dumpster and then he rolls and falls on the ground, basically. They thought they did a great job until they watched the body camera footage of that. So, <laughs> so the question was, how could we do that? And, and you, there's simple, inexpensive tools in the rope world to do stuff like that, like webbing or short pieces of rope. And uh, it's, it, but you have to learn those techniques too. It's, it's going back to the training for the medical side you have to understand what's potentially out there that you could do. And then you need to see how you can do it. So not what to do, but how you can do things using different pieces of equipment. Yeah, and I think it, it goes back to the team having as broad a skill set as they possibly can, right? Like it's, it's <clears throat> I think part of the challenge with a modern SWAT team is there's so many different domains of knowledge that are required. And you know you see teams where they try to maintain that knowledge for everybody. Um, you also see teams where they build cadres, and that seems to be kind of the emerging strategy: is that you know Dana's the rope guy, you know John is the the medic guy, and you can take the team to a deeper level. Is that kind of what's your opinion on that? No, I agree with that because are you going to be the drone operator? Are you going to be the aerial drone operator? Are you going to be the ground drone operator? Are you the, the planner for the hit that you're going to do? Because you could just keep going and going and going, right? Are you the weapons instructor for the team? And you have all these responsibilities, or if everybody does that. Uh, I, I agree, having a cadre, because they can be specialists then. And, you, and for some of these skills, you definitely want specialists to keep everybody on the team safe. And then in, in the liability side of it, they're protecting the team and liability also. Yeah, and you know, it, we're hearing, I'm hearing more and more from teams that they've kind of given up the idea of tactical repelling, where they're, they're going to do the Princess Gate swing down to the window and, you know, all of that. And so, you know, you'll hear like, well, why do I need ropes? Why do I need repelling? Talk to me about some of the reasons that and some of the applications that you see for ropes work in a modern tactical environment. Sure. I mean, again, getting, getting a sniper up into position. That's, that's really common here in LA because, uh, you know, where they have the uh, Academy Awards, they have all these things. It's real, even at SoFi Stadium now with the Rams and the Chargers over there, ESD is up on the rafters all the time. Uh, you have protesters that go up there. So uh, not necessarily on the SWAT operational side of it, but that's a specialty that somebody on the department has to have. 
and not, it's not gonna be the fire USAR guys, particularly if these are suspects. So the team needs to have that capability for, for those type of incidents. So if you go to the, the 5th and Main hostage rescue with LAPD, you know, that developed so quickly because the suspect was acting erratically and violently. And then they did the dual explosive breach on that because it was happened that fast. And uh, that what they would have done talking to the team, the climbing team leader over there, if they had had the time, they would have sent guys down on ropes. Whether it's to breach a window, whether it's to put a diversion outside, throw a drone in, whatever it is. So there's definitely some uses for it. I think what teams aren't seeing is that also that if, let's just say the suspect sets a fire below you, you're two or three stories up and now you have a fire that goes below, that gets started by the suspect below you. Or they, they light off the, the natural gas pipe and, and it's, now you've got natural gas filling the house and you're two or three stories up. Are you gonna run down the stairs or do you wanna just go out that window that's right there? So there are escape techniques that are out there similar to what firemen use on, and train at on a regular basis. But I think SWAT teams should know that because you just never know what's going to happen below you as well. Well, and, and also, the, you know, there's the whole to, to tie it back into the T Triple C conversation. There's also like if one of your guys gets injured in an elevated position, you've got to get him down. Right. Right. Like or, right. or, or a suspect. You know, it's it's. I mean, you're probably a little less concerned with a suspect, but you know, if if somebody gets injured in an elevated position and you can't bring fire in. What do you do? Right. Or just think about being on the fourth or fifth floor. One of your guys is down. Yeah. I mean, are you gonna? It's gonna take a few guys because with equipment and everything else, you're you're gonna be fairly heavy. But how many? How long will it take you to get the guy down to the ground floor as a throw as opposed to breaking out a window, attaching a rope to him because he's got some sort of a rigging belt or something, and then just dropping him to the ground, not dropping him, but lowering yeah, him lowering. to the ground, which could be done in about twenty five to thirty seconds. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. I, I think it's it's trying to trying to articulate to teams why they need to maintain this other capability. With regard to gear for a team, what would you recommend a team carry with them? I think well, I think everybody should have at least a rigging belt on, not a not just a Velcro belt or something like that. You need something like what Aardvark put out with the the, the belt system that you guys have, where you can actually put a, a rigging style belt or a a, a rated belt, like from Misty Mountain or something like that, that, that can be integrated into a harness if you needed to, but you can repel off of that. Uh, and, and that is the first place with two carabiners. Uh, I think every operator on an entry should have 25 to 30 feet of uh, one inch tubular webbing. Because you can, you can escape yourself, you can use it to open doors, you can create a harness with it. There's a variety of uses to use with one-inch tubular webbing. That's what everybody should have. An agency that I work with uh, quite quite often just did that after I did some training with them on what the possibilities with webbing are. And I'm not trying to sell my classes. I'm just yeah. saying those are the possibilities that are out there. But you should have a roping team guy. You you were talking about special. You should have a specialist, and he should have a rope that, depending on the size of the building, is that you can get down at least a hundred feet, if not more. And and then he would have. Uh, the ability to anchor the rope, send the rope out, and then have a carabiner or a device that the agency, the team wants to use so that everybody can uh, bail out. For, again, this is more of the bailout mode. Sure. Uh, there's, you could, for about three pounds weight and really not that much money, you could have a kit that is fully capable to do whatever you want to do with it. And that, that somebody just carries in a backpack and that's where it sits. Yeah, so with a rope. Stuck on a vest or. Right. And even from a rope standpoint, it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a 7 16th inch current metal rope. It can be, you know, smaller. Right. So it, technology obviously has come a long way, even in the rope community. So what the, what the PJs use is an 8 millimeter rope uh, by Sterling. Uh, I know North, North America Rescue has a new 8 millimeter rope. So 8 millimeter is uh, down there in size, so where you would, you would like to be, because 100 feet weighs maybe about three pounds as well. And it's very compressible when you're carrying it. So Dana, obviously, you know, these domains require a lot of expertise. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you and to learn about the programs that you're running? So we have a website, it's www.vtctraining.com. And we offer about 14 different courses. Uh, the majority of them that we have are, are California Post approved. So I, I thought it was important to 
get the state's buy-in uh, for the SWAT community and for the law enforcement community in general to see that we have a, a, an approved program and guys will get the credits necessary for them when they uh, take the classes. Are there any resources or websites you'd recommend? Do, I mean, do, do you have like Dana's reading list or you know, website list? I really don't. I, I ponder that a lot. I, I do a lot of the, just the research myself. Um, but if, on the rope side of it though, there's, there's definitely, if, if you looked at on YouTube, uh, rescue, uh, not rescue craft. Well, there is rescue craft on YouTube, but also uh, Element Rescue. Uh, Sean McKay, he does great videos, explains things very well. A lot of the techniques that we teach are the t techniques that he's teaching, uh, and that's that's a good YouTube resource. Uh, on the tactical medicine side, North American Rescue has uh, some really good content on their website and also on their Instagram. They have a, a NAR doctor. They, they have some really good content going out, updating people on things that are happening regularly. Well, we'll link to all of that in the, in the show notes and make it easier. We'll also link to your website. So, Dana, thanks so much for joining me today. You, you taught me a lot. Thank you, John.